Good afternoon, Ben Jacobs with you for Soccer X Connected. Good morning to those of you in North, South and Central America. Lots listening in Asia as well, where it's heading towards early evening. Tell us where in the world you are watching Soccer X Connected. We want to be as close as possible to you, even though we are unfortunately, of course, socially a distance. Do get in contact at Soccer X on Twitter. We're on Instagram as well and use that hashtag Soccer X Connected. Today is powered by Cell Nutrition and as a result of that, and the fact that we are focusing on performance and analytics, we're asking you something very simple if you want to win one of our signed shirts today, and that is this. What's your favourite football stat or fact? Be quirky and fun. Wow us via at SoccerX on Twitter. MJ's been in touch. He says, I've got one about Louis Saha. He played in five different Premier League derbies, the West London, North London, Merseyside, Manchester, and the Tyne Weir, playing, of course, for Newcastle and also South uh, Sunderland, I should say. And in addition to that, we've got Utkarash Bushan, who has been in touch and said his football uh, fun fact is that the most footballs placed on a football field ever, according to FIFA stats, is 142,393. And that was at Borussia Park in Mönchengladbach in Germany. 320 employees got a world record there so thank you very much indeed for that stat as well loads of you have been in touch tell me your favorite football stat all you've got to do is get in contact via social media at soccer x and you stand a chance of winning our sign shirt of the day you get to pick it as well if you're the winner i've got louis saha jean-pierre papin laurie lindsay from the u.s women's national team carlos alberto deco and many many more have a look at soccer x for the full selection so we've had one panel already and as i said right at the top we're focusing on performance, medical, analytics, nutrition, lots of different aspects to delve into. And our second panel is the One O'Clock GMT and it's sponsored by Stat Sports and it's entitled Where is the Red Zone? Now, the importance of player management is widely accepted, especially during the pandemic. But even before it, FIFA Pro released a interesting report about player management and potentially minutes restrictions as well. So in this session, we are going to be defining the red zone and asking how injuries can be prevented and what metrics are being used to try and prevent less time on the sidelines. To delve into this topic, we're delighted to welcome Alexander Bielefeld, the head of global policy and strategic relations at FIFPro, who wrote that report that I mentioned a moment ago. We also have David Cosgrove, the head of physical performance at FC Copenhagen. Jason Black is with us, research and development sports scientist at Stat Sports, the sponsors of this panel. And we've also got Jawa Brito, sports scientist at the Portuguese Federation. And to moderate the troops, delighted to welcome a reporter from the I newspaper. It's a very good afternoon to Joe Short. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it's very uh, good to know that people from all over the world can still connect, even though we are, you know, or basically in our living rooms, our offices, wherever we are. Um, the idea of the red zone is potentially a controversial topic, as we'll talk about in this uh, discussion. Um, and what, one of the great things about this talk is that we've got four experts who can know who know all about the game um, from the international side and the club side, and they know the overarching um, world view of football, especially when it comes to player injuries and schedules and um, fatigue. So first of all, I'd like to hand over to Dave Cosgrove um, for our first question about, about the red zone, where the concept came from, and if the concept is actually, actually useful for us. Um, Dave. Thanks, Joe, for the question. Uh, the red zone is very contentious because the red zone might be a myth that has been developed by the media. However, what we do know is that players are reaching some form of capacity. They're becoming overloaded. And maybe the media have created this image of the red zone. And when we do some research on the red zone, what we found was uh, 100 years ago, after World War I, there was an area that was 100% uninhabitable after the war, from Lille to Verdun. And this 100% area of uninhabitability became known as La Zone Rouge. And fast forward to Arsene Wenger, when he's asked a question by the media, they ask him, how are your players doing? Are they tired? And he says, I believe my player is in the red zone. 
So we've gone from one French man 100 years later to creating this uh, new metric that has created uh, maybe an end of limit for a player's capacity physically. And now the media have started to conceptualize the red zone. But is the red zone real, Joe? We're not too sure. Well, I suppose if you're talking about capacity, um, the each player in each individual player has a different capacity, doesn't it? Um, and Zhao, you yourself have a different, maybe different take on the red zone um, and what it may maybe means. If is it a myth? Is it not? Hi, hello, and thanks for the for the invitation to be here. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. Uh, I I agree that the, the red zone is is a kind of concept. Um, the, the the main issue is that the people working the uh, in the in the field in the pitch it's it's really hard to find um, a, a single metric that can allow us to say that the player is at a big risk or not. Uh, research is is searching for that since long time, and many metrics are. Uh, have been used to attempt this uh, idea of finding a red zone. Uh, but as far as I know, it's really hard to find uh, something that can tell that the player cannot continue uh, right away. Um, I will say that uh, we sports scientists, we spend a lot of time um, searching for red alerts. Uh, but uh, we might spend a lot, a lot of time and we don't find anything. Great. Well, Dave, I don't know from your point of view, are there any particular red alerts that you've seen recently with, with the COVID um, uh, pandemic kind of restricting European football? Well, I think I found was that we shut down so quickly and we had to restart so quickly that we went from um, zero to 100 extremely quickly. And there has been some studies in, um, in the Bundesliga that found that those first four weeks, the game changed a little bit. The coaches played a different type of style. They were maybe hitting the ball longer. There was a lot more aerial duels, but there wasn't a spike in injuries. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't significant. So even though they went from zero to 100 so quickly, we didn't see anything in the research or in the data. I see. But then, as far as research and data is concerned, I suppose, Jason, from a statistical point of view, um, you guys over at Statsport cover this ground every single day with clubs and countries. Um, and how can we measure, or can we measure, when a player is at breaking point statistically? Cheers, Joe. So I think from our point of view, what we've, I guess, tried to offer a lot of our clients is a feature within our, our solution that allows them to create their own metric called a custom metric calculator. So like any sports scientist out there will know that there's over 200 variables within these that these GPS units actually generate. Now, that's an overwhelming amount of data, but I think the whole idea or concept of the red zone is being able to simplify these metrics into a single value or a single uh, color threshold scale. So that's something that we've tried to do in our system. now. There's a, a danger in trying to simplify metrics because you can miss a lot of the important stuff by trying to simplify into one value. Um, but it's certainly, it's an interesting approach. And I know it's, it is an approach that a lot of our clients have done in terms of trying to amalgamate a few different metrics into using like a multi-mechanical model, which is a research that was done recently into like a single value that represents the volume and the intensity of a session. Um, but I think as Zhao said, like it's, it is really just in a proof of concept stage and there's a lot more to get it to a position that can really, really be actionable. But I think I, I wouldn't disagree that there's, that there's a limit say per se for each player and it is very much individualized. Like there won't be a red zone that you could apply on, a, on an absolute or on a squad basis. It's very much relative to that player, whether that, that player is say, at an increased or elevated risk because they played 90 minutes three games in a week or whether it's a player that's returned from a long-term injury and that they're only kind of getting back into training, like they you need to take them, like their definition of the red zone is very particular to that player and it will change over time. So it's, it, it all really, as we all probably 
touch on today, it all comes back to the communication among that multidisciplinary team. And that's something that we as, as a company have tried to try to widen our target audience that is not just looking at the sports science within the club, but how can we make this data accessible to a wider audience within within clubs and within international teams. And you say there are 200 variables to look at for, for each individual player. Which ones are the, which variables are the most kind of sought after for clubs? Is there any particular, are there any particular ones that you highlight as maybe revealing that a player is more at risk of potentially burning out or getting injured? Well, I think your general positional variables, such as your sprint distance, high speed running meters, the number of sprints, the number of max speed exposures in the course of a week. I think there's a lot of research that have gone into the exposure to maximum speed running and how that mitigates injury risk and particularly in hamstring injuries. Like that's, I guess, the main topic that's kind of been looked at in the last couple of years. But what we've seen is a kind of a shift towards looking at accelerometer data and it's still really in, in its infancy, but metrics related to the stress load that the player is exposed to over the course of a session. So to give an example, you might expose the player to the same demands each week, but if the stress load is increasing, even though they're being exposed to the same demands, that gives us an indication that something's not right and it could potentially be a flag for fatigue. So as I said, there, historically it's all been about like high speed running and maximum speed exposures, but there's the a component within our GPS devices called the accelerometer that has opened up new avenues to go down that route, looking at load management related to, to player impacts and running impacts. And then Zhao and David, I suppose, one of the question that I could ask both of you is, what are the kind of fit, fitness management tactics during a hectic and disrupted, disrupted season that you can actually implement with potentially with the stats that you have from a company like Statsports? Personally, I would like to. Personally, I would like my players not to go on national duty, and I know Joao would uh, like to uh, counter that. <laughs> better you. It's better if you ask your player first if they want to go or not. <laughs> um, I'd say that uh, this is something more relevant at the club level, since uh, in national teams we work uh, in a very congested calendars in very short periods. So uh, the information that we get from uh, the monitoring, it's only valid if we communicate with the clubs and we know what the players are doing at the club level. And then we can provide data back to the clubs so the clubs don't have this gap on information. So there's uh, um, our policy here at the Federation in, in Portugal is that we try to individualize the metrics at the player level. So instead of um, using our own system and our own metrics, we try to use the metrics that every club is using because the, the clubs use different metrics themselves. Otherwise, we really don't understand uh, uh, what is happening with the, with the player. It's, it's really funny that we all talk about technology and we all talk about monitoring and loads. And then we individualize very little on the metrics that we use. For instance, everybody says the number of sprints, the number of high intensity runs, and, and then the, the same cutoff values are used for every player. And technology allows us to individualize a little bit more than that, but at, actually people are not doing that that much. Mm. it's not an easy task but but maybe we should try to to do it and david is that something you've experienced about monitoring individual players at club level yeah i think it's really important that we start moving on this conversation on the player welfare and making sure that we're individualizing what each player needs and having such great technology supporters um, who can tell you exactly what each individual needs means you can tailor what they need for that week but also if we are sending our player on international um, duty we do know that they're going to have an extra three games that uh, two-week period or maybe up to 10 games in a season so the fixture congestion becomes so high that maybe your player doesn't need to have those maximum sprints so you start decreasing 
what he's going to get outside as he leaves um, the safety of your own club and you pass him on to the national organization. So that link between the national organization and player welfare becomes very important because too much water kills the flower, Joe. And if you add in too many sprints, if you add in too much load in the club, then there's definitely going to be a problem further on. And I think we become better at discussing player care, individualized player welfare with all the different stakeholders in uh, the football community. And obviously those stakeholders are, are vast, aren't they? It's not just the clubs or the national teams, it's everyone else involved around individual football players and the team. Um, I'd like to bring in Alexander at this point, I suppose, because um, one of the things at FIFPRO you would look at are things about rest periods and the impact of travel for players, especially during this coronavirus period. Um, what do you make of what do you, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, thanks of all. Uh, thanks, of course, for being here. Um, let me make a remark first. I think uh, I, I, we can be really glad, glad that we're not in the same business as the other guys on the individual conditioning and performance side of the players. Um, because it's just a really incredibly tough job in the in the current framework they're operating in, right? And we we, we just saw the discussion between between Joao and and Dave and and the different perspectives from from club and national team level. Um, and uh, there's no question that I think everyone, uh, both on the national team side and the club side, and whatever com competition we're talking about, has the, the interest of the player at their at, carries it at their heart in terms of the player welfare perspective, right? Um, but unfortunately, the business we are in as, as FIFA on the, on the macro level, basically, of the, of the competition calendar and the football industry is basically um, is, is a business at the moment which makes it very difficult um, in terms of what we have created as a framework to allow um, conditioning coaches and performance coaches to basically protect players in their, in their playing environments, simply because we have created a framework um, which um, at the elite level of the game um, exposes the players to excessive overload, right? Um, and when it comes to the concept of, uh, of red zones, then um, obviously on the individual level of the player, always um, there are always variations in there. And the guys just described that from a, from a performance uh, and load management perspective. Um, I think when you look at it globally, there, there's, and everyone knows that um, coming back from a high intensity workout, that obviously there are limits and, and basically capacity thresholds um, to what your body um, can do and what rest and recovery your body needs after such a workout, right? Um, and um, these metrics from our point of view um, in professional football, they, they include in and off season breaks, rest periods between matches, for example, Dave mentioned them of retraining as well actually and we saw that in the emergency period now of the calendar um, and the truth is basically that we have created a calendar which is very unforgiving because it doesn't provide any rest periods to the players at the moment right so there there are no mandatory rest periods um, uh, and if we go back to, to basically our studies it's really what you mentioned it's not just a high load in terms of matches which is gets us over the threshold of 70 70 matches but it's especially also for players from South America and from Asia playing in Europe or elsewhere, uh, a very high load in terms of travel intensity, um, which impacts the body um, and the recovery. Um, and the challenge in professional football is, is frankly that we have so many different stakeholders, so many different competition organizers and owners uh, in the industry, which, and that's out of our experience, um, where everyone in the discussions always place player workload first. However, when it comes obviously also to the legitimate interest of scheduling competitions, um, that principle of player workload um, is, is certainly not coming first and player health and safety. And we basically are in a situation where we risk really the most import, important resource of our game, which, which are the players, right, at the elite end of the game. Um, so we definitely need to, to address the question on the calendar on the macro level in order to allow people on the, on the micro level who are involved with the management of the player load um, to actually do their job. Jason, is it is it noticeable when you track players statistically who have had rest periods compared to those who are playing once, twice, three times a week, maybe? I think it can be difficult to kind of say because it really comes down to the player in question. Mm. I think from, a, from an international team perspective, I think one of the most important metrics for our manager is minutes played for our players coming into camp. So 
really we want players that are robust and that we know are going to be able to play three games in seven days. So that 48 hours between games is enough for them to recover. And that's, again, very specific to that player. But you'll find that players say that maybe in like their early 30s might need a full week to recover or depending on their previous injury history, might be younger, but would still need a full week to recover between games. So I think it's not really as much about this, the, the specific statistics in that point of view, but just really having an understanding of what that player is capable of and if they're able to reproduce that, that I guess, intensity for each game. Because as we know, like when you go from like a, a club level to an international level, from what from the data that I've seen, it's a step up in terms of intensity. And particularly now, when the international games that they play in a year, there's far more competitive games with the introduction of the Awake Nations League and so on. It's not just really about a balance between some friendlies and some World Cup European qualifiers. There's also more UEFA Nations League games and more competitive games, which means that the intensity never really drops off and you don't really have that opportunity to rotate your players. Even though you're bringing 20, 30 players into a camp, you might choose between the same 15 for your starting 11 each each game. So you need players that are robust and like there will be flags around. If their intensity drops off, you will be able to see that in terms of looking at like a, a distance per minute metric, or as I said earlier, if you're looking at a dynamic stress load, um, another metric that can give us an indication of fatigue, but really it's around the conversations that you're having with your player, that subjective feedback from them, like their own interpretation of how they're feeling is just as important to us as a lot of the data that we collect. Mm. And Jao, obviously managing a, a group of international footballers suddenly in the Portugal camp, um, what fitness management tactics do you guys have in order to, in order to maintain the fitness levels of these players? Um, and is it simply a case of trying to get them through those international windows? Um, I don't know if we can really maintain anything. Um, the thing is that... Uh, we really try to focus on recover, recovery and player preparedness for the next match. Mm-hmm. It's uh, some, sometimes now we have only two, three days uh, of uh, training before the first match and then we have two or three matches in a row. So the, the, the full focus on it's on recovery. So it's not on the, it's not fitness tactics, it's, it's full recovery. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we understand recovery uh, as a really broad uh, concept where you, f- you can uh, introduce, for instance, physiotherapy and the service of physiotherapy as a priority for the players during this period. And normal people don't think this is as a priority, uh, but we really believe so that uh, it should be like that. But uh, if you don't mind, let me just go a little backwards on the on the red zone. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it's really interesting that uh, research tells us that at the team level, when you have a congested picture, the physical metrics really don't change that much. But the data from the UEFA Elite Club injury study tells us that there is actually a, a red zone that it's when you have less than five days in between matches. Uh, so we have a lot of technology to, 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 to monitor players. And then we have this really basic metric that is the time between matches that might be a really uh, rather lot for us to, to use. And Alexander, that's something you've mentioned as well as the, the rest periods. Um, are so important for for all footballers. Yeah, I mean, Joe just just mentioned it, right? That the recovery in between um, these periods um, are, are so central. And uh, let us also be honest, right? I mean, we we are dealing with high performance sports, right? So 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 players um, they want to push their limits. They want to go sometimes into a red zone, right? Um, so it's it's par- partially part of let's say of of the fabric of the game. The problem is not if that occurs within one game week or two game weeks or within the context of an international tournament. Um, the problem is, and Jason referred to that, is if, if we have these ongoing competition cycles, basically, 
where you cannot, you basically have no space within the calendar for recovery anymore. And I think this, this makes these, these mandatory rest periods for in-season breaks, off-season breaks so, so important. And when we surveyed players, 85% of, of elite players across competitions were basically in favor of uh, in-season breaks. So basically a winter break, for example, in the season, right? Um, which makes the recovery uh, easier for them. The, the other problem specifically in the emergency period now um, where we have even a more condensed match calendar because of the time we lost. Um, and uh, in, in that context, basically, we're moving now really from tournament to tournament, right? I mean, we have, in theory, still uh, the European Championships coming up this summer. We're moving towards the World Cup in Qatar in 2022. And within that, we basically have almost no space for, for training periods, for recovery periods, um, for retraining periods uh, in the calendar at the moment. And just from a, from a calendar perspective, I think we have to ask ourselves as an industry, as we go into a revision of the calendar between the stakeholders uh, in, in 20, for the period post-2024, what we as, as, as a football industry want from a calendar. I mean, on the one hand, we want to define economic opportunities and competition opportunities for everyone. Um, on the other side, we want to create or we must create an industry, a, a calendar which allows us to keep the best talent, the best players in the industry for a long period of time, because that's our most important resource. I think that's, that's logical. Um, and at the same time, we need to enable them to reach peak performance. Um, and that brings me back to what Joao just discussed. Um, that's the fact in and around um, what they can actually still do in such a congested calendar with the players when they have them in training. And, and Dave referred to that as well, is well, we can only focus on recovery. So, so suddenly the players spend less and less time on, on training, on, on certain developments of the game, because that basically poses too much of a high risk in terms of injury or actually being game ready um, the next day or the next two days. So we need to allow players also the time to basically become the best athletes they can be. And that requires intense training and not just recovery. Um, and we need to, to get a better balance in the calendar for that. And and Dave, when uh, if we look back to last summer, you you've mentioned before uh, a conversation with me about how the FC Copenhagen players, who kind of played through the summer as a lot of players did throughout Europe, went uh, went to the Europa League to play in the uh, to play in the kind of knockout tournament there that they held, and then very quickly we're back into the new season. And and how did how did um, how did you from a club level kind of view the, the the physicality of the players there were they were they still holding up or was it alarming to see joe uh, joe it's amazing we um we're talking about players but behind the player um tag there's actually people here and there's an emotional and there's a cognitive part of this red zone that we maybe aren't discussing because we're talking about the physical part and the players can only take so much stimulation and they can only take so many highs and so many lows. And so they do need this time to recharge their batteries. And in our case, we didn't get a holiday and we didn't get a preseason. So the players were straight into international um, camps, which was a bit disappointing for us as a football club. But I do agree that going to your national team and being with your brothers and being with your, your family it's a, that's a very good cognitive recovery. So sending the players to be with their, um, their brethren was something that they all voted for themselves. They really wanted to go while the club was feeling, these guys need a holiday. FIFA Pro have recommended to all the national associations that they shouldn't call up these players. But we tried to stop them. But because uh, as stakeholders, we weren't powerful enough the players were de uh, demanded to go uh, to their country. And we can see that it made them very happy to be with their brothers. So uh, we didn't stand in their way. Uh, Jao, do you have anything to say about that? Like, did, did you notice that the players were, may if maybe physically um, not perfect, then at least emotionally they were happy to be in the, in the Portugal camp most recently? Uh, yeah, th this can happen, uh, but uh, that, that's why communication between clubs and national teams are so important. And I can tell you that at the highest level, the easiest it is to work with. 
uh, the people. So uh, we don't have a, a big issue with communication with the clubs and the level that we can integrate with the uh, with the clubs at at this point allows us to adapt the the training programs during the the periods they are here with us. Mm -hmm. We can have uh, 25 players and they have there are 25 different programs in the gym and this is okay because we don't do our programs. We try that the players can continue what they are doing at the club mm. while with the national teams. So communication is absolutely key. Um, and I believe this is something that people should be open-minded to. I'd like to come back to communication in a few minutes, but I just wanted to ask Jason as well. Um, are there any metrics that you guys use um, to gauge the kind of emotional level of a player statistically that can then be fed to a national team or a club? Um, not as much, no, but we, we do have applications that would allow us to administer like wellness questionnaires and subjective questionnaires. Uh, so the player would take ownership over that to fill in like, a daily report as to the how they slept, how they're feeling related to their tiredness, muscle soreness, hydration, nutrition, but it's all just their subjective feedback, um, which is, I guess for us, it's just, just as important because it's another piece of the puzzle that we can match up with the physical data and then ultimately see if the sleep is low, if the soreness is high, are the physical metrics suffering then as a consequence. Um, so get, you get a, a fuller picture of the athlete. But um, I think just to touch on, I guess, what, what Zhao and, and David spoke about, one thing that we've tried to do um, as, a, as a company is provide the infrastructure to allow clubs and international teams to share this data in a really, really seamless way. So we have a, an application called the Stats Sports Exchange, which essentially allows any Stats Sports client or any club out there that uses our, our software and our applications to share this physical data or like wellness data with the international team um, through like a, an online API so that you generally find that one week before an international camp, the, the international sports scientists will touch base with the, with the club sports scientists and this data will then be shared. So you can get a quick insight into what's been done in the last two weeks at the club and then tailor training at the international team with the previous knowledge of what's been done in that lead-in. So you're not coming in completely blind and you have a, a benchmark really as to, to where this player is in terms of what they've done over the last two weeks. Mm. Well, that's that's uh, interesting. Um, it's interesting what you say there, Jason, because we, we've had a question in and I think I could ask this to Joao. Um, are, are players monitored on regimes similar to those at the clubs? Um, or like, is that impossible to do to kind of track each player on the same regime? I think it's uh, it's it's feasible. Uh, the mm -hmm. only issue is related with uh, with the technologies uh, that are used. You might use uh, one brand of GPS, and the club is using a different one. And if you know a little bit about the technology, you understand that uh, the absolute values are different. So if you have this in mind um, and, and if you control for that, this is not a big issue. Um, I don't how, about, that. how about you, Dave, from a club point of view, how much communication would you have with a national team before sending the, as um, Jason said, maybe a week before, um, how much conversation do you have before sending a player out onto international level? Uh, I, I would agree with Joe's point that if you have a well-resourced uh, department uh, and you have a well-resourced national team, uh, the level of communication and the quality of that communication will be extremely high. It's when you're dealing with a lower-resourced uh, national team or you're coming from um, a club yourself where uh, you're under underfunded or over-demanded, then communication barriers will definitely create those um uh, danger areas that none of us want to be involved in. And does does a lack of communication also create a bit of confusion between the national team and the and the clubs themselves? Well, you can never be too sure which stakeholder you're communicating with and who's responsible or accountable. So if you don't get a clear line of communication, then the risks can be uh, can be really profound. Um, and if you haven't invested time in building that relationship. Uh, then it's going to be very easy for a mistake to be made. 
I'd, um, I'd like to move on now, Alexander, if I may, um, just to ask about potential player safeguards and what we can actually do to, you know, if, if someone was to come come away from this conversation today with a bit of a checklist of things that are required to ease the strain on, on players as footballers and uh, as people, what, what would you say that are those main points? Well, I think first, I think we have to, to recognize that what the issue we're talking about in terms of excessive overload is, is an, a, a challenge or a problem within the, the elite level of our game, right? So we have a lot of players, both in men's and women's football, who actually have a problem rather with, with underload, not enough playing opportunities, for example. So I think it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, I think what, what Dave and John briefly spoke about in terms of, uh, of basically of, of the mental health of the players as well and the mental capacity of the players, it's, it's really important to keep that in mind as well, um, especially when we're talking about, about player safeguards as well. Um, so I think it's very rare that in that very competitive environment in which an individual player basically follows his profession, um, that they will admit to a weakness, right? Both because that that basically exposes them in the public, it exposes them potentially towards the teammates. But if we follow the debate in the public, especially especially in the past six months during the emergency period, we had so many players commenting on the on the strain, basically the excessive uh, calendar puts on them, right? Um, it's very remarkable because first of all, it exposes them, as I said, and second of all, usually athletes are not are not wired the way they grew up, the way they are, they are really, they, they're operating to, to accept weaknesses, right? It's not nothing which, which comes often naturally to them. So the fact that so many people, players are talking about that is it actually points to the fact that there seems to be something really off. Uh, now, in terms of safeguards, because players are so like, they, they are fierce competitors and, and Dave and, and Joao know that from their club and or national team environment, right? They want to compete. So sometimes we as an industry have to think about a safeguards, um, which basically have to be introduced also to protect the players, even though probably a player wants to play. We have seen enough also in other occasions that a player with a serious concussion wants to go back on the field, right? Even though he shouldn't. So we need sometimes safeguards for athletes, um, which they probably in that situation don't think are relevant for themselves. So we need to think about that in the calendar. Um, we can think about soft and hard caps. We can look into other sports where I think we have a much more rigid system in terms of also allowing players um, to take part in back-to-back -back games. Um, we have such uh, regulations, for example, in rugby. Um, we have similar regulations also uh, in the NFL. So it's really something we, we need to take a look at. Um, and um, just to, to point to that fact, again, what Dave said now in the, the September period, um, we, we still had friendly matches going on, right? We also need to look at what are, the re what are really the important matches we have to play in, in our competitions and which players should be eligible for that. So the answer is not that easy, but there are certain safeguards, as, which I mentioned before as well, like in-season breaks, for example, um, off-season breaks, which we need to make mandatory um, and they can probably be, be flexible. Uh, but those are the discussions which we need to have at the regulatory level between the stakeholders um, very soon. When you say very soon, would that be 2024 when the kind of the cycle starts again? Or is, is this something that we need to look at in the next six months, one year, two years? Well, we push everyone to basically look at that immediately because I think um, there's no reason why we should put any any protection measures um, for, for players on the backbench um, on and I think um, not too many stakeholders have really engaged in that debate, um, I have to admit. Um, but everyone admits that it's a huge issue, right? And everyone refers to the big calendar reform post-2024. It's a conversation which basically needs to start this year. So we're certainly looking forward to that. And we'll, we'll see actually how everyone is committed to that, right? Um, but um, it's very clear if everyone wants more competitions and if everyone wants legitimately to advance their competitions, also with regards to club and national team level, then we are in a situation right now where we can play as many matches as we want, as long as there are specific safeguards on a player level, um, basically to, to allocate those amount of matches amongst the bigger playing group. And there are added values to that as well. I mean, it gives more opportunity to younger players to maybe come in, right? Um, give more playing opportunities to a wider playing community, so we, we shouldn't just look at the downside there. I think there, there's certainly an upside to that as well. Mm. 
And um, Jason, I just wanted to ask, like, when Statsports collect all the data for a particular client, whether it's a team or a national team, a club or a national team, do you then make recommendations alongside that data or is it simply a case of here is our data and make of it what you will? Well, the way it works is we don't actually access the data. The data is under the responsibility of the club and even the receiver. A lot of it is related to the actual player, I guess, depending on the contract. But that's a conversation for another day. But <laughs> that, that is owned by the, by the club or the international team, as you said. But so we can actually see it as it happens. But what we've, I guess, tried to do to, I guess, promote this idea of providing this data in real time. And for us, that's been the biggest change in the industry in that Historically, this data has been available post-session. So essentially, the, the players will wear the pods during their session. The sports scientists will then, at the end of the session, take the pod, download it, and look at the data. But you could be in a situation there where the damage is already done. So what we've kind of done is shifted this in that allowing people to access this data live on like a wireless application. So our physios and rehab specialists will look at this on like a, a watch application called Sonar Watch, where they're able to monitor this data. And then alternatively from a more like team-based approach we have a I guess Sonar Live so it's an iPad application that again allows a sports scientist or a coach to look at all of this data in real time during a session or even during a game and be able to I guess interpret that data as well as communicate to the rest of the, the coaching and medical staff as to where they think a player sits so mm. we've really kind of promoted that real-time data in a way of as a method of trying to safeguard against or mitigate injury risk. Hmm. I suppose one of the things we've talked about a lot is talking about players who are currently fit and how to stop them being injured. But Dave, I just wanted to ask um, from a club perspective, when a player is injured, especially during these times, have you changed your approach to how that player would recover? Um, because we were very, very unsure about when we might have to start again, we had to really bring them up to speed and we had to get them up to a, an overload threshold because you know one of the best predictors of a guy who's going to be able to play 70 games in a season is that he has played 70 games in a season before so if you have a guy sitting on the bed for two years that will be really difficult for him and he definitely uh, won't be um, helping the team uh, in a performance cycle so you really have to try and get that load as high as possible as safe as possible and the data really is there for everybody to know what the peak game demands are if you're going to compete in the Champions League or in a Europa game or at a high level um, UEFA national competition. So you, you have something to aim for and you try and hit that target as safely as possible. Hmm. We, have, um, we have a question that's come in, um, which I suppose could be directed at all four of you. Um, should clubs, especially those at the, uh, at the richer elite European club level, doing more to help drive the adoption of player monitoring in developing nations FAs. So for example, um, players who might, uh, clubs who might have players from smaller football associations, should they be the ones who take the responsibility of helping those football associations to improve their own uh, research and data? Well, I, I can I can probably take that one, um, but more on the macro level. Um, and I don't want to make it a solidarity debate about who should bear the finances, right? But I mean, what we can observe in the industry and the three guys with me on the panel know that probably much better, that we can see a race towards data scientists and basically providing the infrastructure and resources within the club environment, basically to make sense of all the data we're, we're starting to collect of the players, right? Um, and that requires resources um, more and more. And I think it's fair to say that, especially within small and medium club environments, we also know that those resources are, are not available. And, and this requires, uh, it's a scarce talent as well. So it's not that these people who can do their job are available everywhere. So it's not just a matter about financing it, but it's a, it's, it's, it's a matter of having the right people, about training them, um, the right skill level. So I think... The answer is not so easy as to say, should the big clubs bear those costs? But should we as an industry um, increase our capacity to actually make sense of the data we collect of the players? And should we have better standards around that? Sure. Um, and that applies to a lot of clubs 
and national teams around the world. And when we look at other sports, I mean, Alex, you mentioned the NBA, rugby. Uh, well, you mentioned rugby and the NFL, but also the NBA is a sport where players are expected to play 80 games four times a week and travel across an entire continent. Um, and is that is, is the NBA or art of a sport something that football should really look at um, in order to improve their understanding of player safeguards? Although I think we're we're an industry which can always learn from other sports, and probably sometimes we don't do that do that often enough. Um, but I was just yesterday on a call with the NFL Players Association and the NBA Players Association um, uh, concerning player performance data. Um, and uh, what is interesting to observe is that that there's probably um, a bit more there's more skepticism out there towards so like what technology can can really help to so like support recovery and, and load management. Um, and uh, I personally think that probably we'll see um, the next evolution of technology coming into the game over the next couple of years. So um, that process is definitely not at an end, um, but different playing groups have different experiences with regards to the, to the application of technology. And we know that it has a huge impact actually on how players train and how they, how they play the game ultimately, right? I think we, we have to spend more time of, of understanding that because we just talked to a player a couple of weeks ago who said, well, I know that my club is tracking um, different types of event data about my performance in training, which led that player to actually only focus on his strength and only play the ball with his uh, strong foot rather than with the weak foot to basically make less mistakes in training and to have better scores um, in the training environment uh, on the data which is tracked of him. So I think there are so many nuances of, of data coming into the game and making sense of it that we as an industry have to, yeah, we have to just spend more time of, of analyzing it and finding the right answers. Mm. And Dave, I suppose talking about data there, is data only really available to those top clubs and top uh, nations? Or, you know, is it possible that smaller clubs with smaller resources can tap into data as well? <clears throat> Yeah, the innovation um, cycle has happened uh, so quickly now that uh, every club and every player has access to all this data. And simply by having a, a, a branded phone on a sleeve on your arm, you, even the amateur players can get all the data and it's, um, it's totally available to them now. So we've now reached uh, probably this mask, um, this mask period of everybody having access to all of their load data with um, all the innovation that's happened with technology and phones. Oh, well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'd just like to, again, say thanks to Alexander Baufeld, David Cosgrave, Jao Brito and Jason Black. Um, I think as we've kind of discovered that the red zone maybe doesn't exist, but it's a good potential metaphor for us to use when understanding when a player might be pushing too far and uh, you know too soon effectively um so yeah thank you very much for joining us today and um back to the studio